Hello and welcome uh, to this video on the basics of the solo growth model and the basic setup of it. So the target audience for this video is a student either in a high level intro to macro course or uh, for most an intermediate level macroeconomics course. So I'm TAing a macro course now and uh, you know there's a lot of good text floating around the internet on the solo model but not too many videos and not as many examples and applications of problems uh, as I'd like to see available to students. So with this series I hope to give a pretty comprehensive review of the trickier material that you'll be expected to know about the model uh, and that you know it's a, in a typical undergrad macro course on uh, macroeconomics. Um, also in terms of how I like to approach all the material I prefer to focus on the nitty-gritty details and examples uh, and problems that you'll likely be asked on an exam. So I'll cover the more boring and technical material related to the model uh, rather than the kind of the funner more intuition that you hopefully get from a professor and lecture. So the technical stuff is important for your grade and you know doing well in any typical back of course. Uh, yeah, so uh, I hope. Uh, yeah, I mean this video is also one of many others. So if you want to skip ahead to a specific topic or uh, to the other topics, check out the video description for useful links on Solo. So yeah, the Solo model, um, aka the neoclassical growth model, also known as the Solo Swan model, also known as the exogenous growth model. Uh, it's a model to help us understand uh, why economies might grow, and at the very least, it's part of the story. So the Solo model is usually the second model of economic growth taught to students. Uh, Solo usually comes right after your professor points out that a macroeconomy can grow if you increase the factors in the production function. You know, um, so. If you increase the quantity of capital or you increase the quantity of labor, that's going to increase overall output and the economy's grown. Uh, at least it's grown, you know, in a form of growth. The classical growth model, so where the solo model is a neoclassical model, in classical gro growth theory, um, I mean, in, in my mind, classical growth theory basically boils down to pointing out that uh, the economy benefits from increased specialization. So specialization within an economy and trade between economies allows for economies of scale and overall benefits. So kind of think um, comparative advantage when you think of classical growth theory. Um, the solo model is kind of the next step. Um, the solo model, it's a simple model of just how an economy works. So you got capital, you've got workers, you've got a goods market, and you got more. And it presents a simple framework on how these things could come together to result in sustained economic growth in a, ray, in a way that rings you know, true intuitively and somewhat empirically as well. Um, at its very most basic, you know, to summarize it as simple as I possibly can, um, so probably not too useful, but its most basic, the solo model um, shows that in the long run, an economy's rate of savings determines the size of the capital stock and therefore the level of production um, and its per capita output. So, uh, you know, the higher the rate of savings, the higher the stock of capital and the higher the level of output. Um, the model relates economic growth to changes in factors, so that's like labor and capital, and to preferences to save, that's the savings rate, um, plus other features of the economy like the depreciation rate, population growth, and technology. So we'll get to all those details right now. So the first part of the model I should point out is the uh, this introduction of the concept of time, where a lot of models you learn are kind of static models. You know, there's maybe one period or another period. There's this and it relates to that. Uh, the solo model is a dynamic model. So there's uh, there are economics economic variables that evolve through time. Um, so uh, thus the model is in discrete time. Uh, it could also be worked out in continuous time, but that's continuous time for later. Um, so time is broken into periods. You have one period and then the next period and the next period, and it's all marked with these little subscripts, some t. Um, so take a variable, yeah, like y sub t. This means that it's the value of all outputs in the economy at time t. If you were to have a subscript, uh, so y sub t plus 1, that would be the uh, value of y, you know, aggregate output in the economy at the period t plus 1. Uh, and it's the same, you know, for capital and other variables that have um, a time subscript. So it's pretty intuitive use of time. Uh, the next thing to note is that it's a closed economy, so there's no trade in this model yet. Uh, in fact, we usually don't even bring trade or exports or anything like that um, into the model at all. Uh, there's also one good in the economy. We're going to call it uh, Y or output or income. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this model is a super simple model. You can maybe think of Y as something like value or, um, yeah, the value of all goods and services produced. But um, technically, there's just one good in the model. So there's uh, one amount of production, one amount of income, uh, and that income could either be used for investment or consumption, which we'll get to in a second. 
um, there's kind of the following five key variables of the economy, uh, and by variable I mean that uh, you know they're dynamic, they either change through time or they're uh, endogenous, they're determined within the model. Um, it's sometimes more complicated than that. So for example, labor for the simple version that I'm gonna cover is uh, fixed in this model, so it's treated as exogenous, but uh, later on we'll introduce a population growth rate. But um, And then we're also gonna have a number of parameters. So the first parameter, um, well, first of all, parameters are just kind of treated as exogenous and constant. Um, you know, there's no real endogenous or internal way that the savings rate or depreciation, re depreciation rate or the other parameters later introduced. Um, there's no endogenous way that those things are determined. They're just given to you. So the savings rate is blah. The depreciation rate is etc. Uh, we also got the savings rate, that's S, so no notationally designated by the lowercase s. This is a percentage, so it's a number between 0 and 1 of one's income that is quote-unquote saved or investment. The rest of the income is consumed. So over here in the goods market, right, you have a certain amount of income, that's how much uh, is produced in the economy, uh, that income goes to people, and people could do two things with it. They could either consume it, which is our proxy for welfare, or they could invest it. Uh, and another way to rewrite investment is it's a certain percentage, the savings rate times overall income. And then consumption is just one minus that savings rate, so that's the consumption rate. Um, that's the portion of the income that's consumed. Uh, a little bit more on investment, you know, that's the portion of income that's saved. So what, what does that mean that we're saving it, right? Con consumption is something that's pretty clear. You imagine people use it, it goes away, it disappears. But what happens when we save something? Well, savings is invested into the capital stock. That is to say, it's converted into capital, it's added to capital. So um, I, right here, if there's anything that's saved, it adds to the capital stock. Uh, L is a labor supply, um, so that's kind of the size of the, the labor force or the population, um, that, or the aggregate number of households, depending on how, we, how you want to think about it, um, all at time T. Uh, notationally, I've seen in other textbooks, I think Blanchard and, and maybe others uh, refer to it as N, so N sub T for uh, labor or population. Uh, and then in terms of technology or production, right, so uh, we have a production function down here. Um, it takes in the factors, so capital and labor, and you put those things together into the economy and you produce a certain amount of output. And then the, the functional form that we're going to be using, and in fact all intermediate textbooks that I've seen so far, the major ones anyway, uh, use a Cobb-Douglas uh, production function or, or a form of the Cobb-Douglas production function that looks something like this. So um, you add capital, you add labor, that increases output. And they're doing construction outside my window, so I'm going to pause this video for a little while. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Outside my window, there uh, there's an open pit with the construction workers periodically jackhammering and cutting something or another. So I chose a poorly as to the day to make this video. Um, anyway, next let's uh, now turn these uh, all these variables into per capita values. So uh, notationally, um, for, well, first off, when I say per capita, uh, note that I'm saying per capita, not per capital. Uh, per capita is and as in you know per worker. Notationally, the lowercase for each of these things, uh, lowercase k, lowercase y, lowercase i, and lowercase c, um, corresponds to per capita values of each. Um, so there's an aggregate value, and you divide that by the labor force. So per capita capital is aggregate capital divided by the labor force. Per capita output is aggregate output or income divided by the labor force. Um, per capita investment is aggregate total investment divided by the workforce population. And then per capita consumption is total consumption divided by the workforce. Um, I should also say a few more things about production technology. Um, so let me set that up for you. So uh, we need to see a few assumptions to fully characterize the production function. Uh, these assumptions are required for the rest of the model to work um, and end up with the results that we you know, end up with. If we relax these assumptions uh, too much, we might lose or not you know, fully get all the results we end up with. Um, I sometimes feel a little weird about going over or mentioning these uh, assumptions to an intermediate level you know, econ students, since we generally gloss over that in an initial class. Uh, but these are assumptions uh, are required to create the proofs of the interesting, you know, results and conclusions. Um, so for co completing this, I thought I'd kind of quickly go over them for you. So first off, we uh, need our production function to exhibit constant returns to scale. 
constant returns of scale um, implies that you know if we double the factors, like we double capital and labor, then we double the output. Um, it's going to be required because when we convert our production function into per capita terms, um, it, it gets this you know nice nice uh, result where um, per capita consumption is just a function of um, per capita capital. Um, we also need to kind of characterize the shape of our production function. So um, we assume that uh, per worker production function is characterized by positive and diminishing mar uh, returns to scale. So uh, by positive returns to scale, this means that if we increase capital or we increase labor, then we're going to increase production, right? So we, we have a certain amount of output, we increase capital, we can increase labor. No matter what, it's always going to go up. So output's always going to go up if we increase either or both of those factors. But by diminishing returns to scale, um, it implies that, um, so as you increase capital, output's going up, but it's going up at a de decreasing rate, you know. So um, this is a 3D image of a Kopdalka's production function. Um, so diminishing marginal returns implies that uh, along this axis right here, we're increasing labor. The vertical axis here is production, you know, Y. So you can see as we increase output, production's always going up, you know, that's that positive, but it's going at, up at a decreasing rate. So the shape is concave, like a cave. Uh, okay. So next up we have these uh, not assumptions. Um, it tells you that, you know, if capital or labor um, is zero, then the return to adding a little bit of capital or adding a little bit of labor is infinite, right? So um, I guess if capital or labor is at zero, then the production function is at zero, right? So if this K is zero or this L is zero, then aggregate production zero. So adding uh, an infinitely small amount of extra labor, you know, starting off at zero, adding a tiny bit, that's going to mean the production is positive, implying that um, the return to that bit of capital or the return to that bit of labor, if we start off with zero, uh, is infinite. And then also, if our capital stock is infinity, um, then the value of adding a little bit extra capital is zero. And then similarly, if we have an infinite number of workers, adding an extra worker doesn't change um, you know, the level of production at all. Um, so that kind of characterizes the shape of that production function. So the slope of this point over here right at zero is infinite. And the slope as we increase uh, labor to infinity um, is zero. And then the last two assumptions are just kind of tell you that the factors are important, right? So the first one here is if uh, there's no capital, if there's no labor, there's no production. The next one, if there's no capital, um, but there's some labor, once again, no production. Uh, and the same thing, if there's a little bit of capital or there's some capital, but no labor, production again is zero. So basically the factors are important. And then lastly, um, the, uh, what is that, the cross factor elasticity? The, uh, can't remember what this is exactly called, but it, it tells you that uh, capital and labor are complements. Um, that's the cross partial. So the cross partial derivative of the production function is positive, implying that capital and labor, the factors are complements. So lastly, let's talk about the uh, capital accumulation equation. Well, I mean, lastly in the setup, uh, the capital accumulation equation, uh, you might also see it referred to as the law of motion of capital. It tells you how capital changes through time. Um, before, you know, the model with just the production that preceded discussion of the solo model, uh, the capital stock K was just taken as exogenous. So the solo model makes the stock of capital endogenous, so it makes this little process that defines what capital is going to be from one period to the next. So the stock of capital next period, so K sub T plus 1, is equal to yesterday's stock, right? So you had some stock that you started off with, and next period is going to be based off that. Minus depreciation where depreciation is the rate at which capital is destroyed from one period to the next. So uh, you could think of it, you know, if capital lasts, let's say, for 100 years, then the depreciation rate is about 1%. Um, so it's, it's, some, it's some rate that defines how capital kind of like degrades over time. Uh, and then plus investment. Remember, investment is the portion of one's income that uh, people save, and that savings gets that converted into capital. So, uh, you know, you take the current capital stock, minus how much depreciated plus investment, and that's going to give you the capital the next period, the capital stock the next period. Cool. So that's the setup of, of the model. Um, before we get to the steady state, um, let's 
um, let's think about how all of these things kind of add together. You know, when we get all of these things together in motion, you know, this is a dynamic equation and we've kind of defined how things can change from one period to the next, uh, you know, what, what happens. So let's, let's kind of work through the model and solve the model. So as our first step, um, let's convert all the uh, all our stuff into per capita terms. So we're going to take the production function um, right here. Uh, we're going to find what it's equal to in terms of per capita. So first off, uh, as a notational kind of trick, um, think about per capita production, right? So per capita production, lowercase y, is aggregate production divided by the quantity of labor. So capital Y divided by capital L. Um, another way to rewrite that, right, is we, it's just the production function. You know, uh, Y, the production function, is just the production function. So it's a function of capital labor divided by L. Uh, and then since this production function is constant returns to scale, um, we know that, you know, if you multiply something by... Um, uh, since the production function is constant returns to scale, uh, if we multiply the factors um, in the production function by some amount, then you'll increase output y by that amount. So similarly, um, it works the other way. If you reduce aggregate output by some amount, then you can do that by reducing the factors by the same amount. Thus, lowercase y per capita output is equivalent to the production function with per capita factors. Um, so note that this only works because of constant returns of scale assumption. Um, now, the capital stock is divided by the labor force is uh, per capita. So, uh, you know, the capital stock here divided by L, that's just lowercase k, that's per capita capital. Uh, and then the labor force divided by labor force, you know, that's just one. So as a notational uh, kind of thing, we de denote output per worker, output per uh, capita, um, as f of lowercase k. And then uh, to drive the point home, we have a nice squiggly f there. Cool. But uh, remember our production function, right, was this Cobb-Douglas production function. You know, so where a is total factor of productivity, um, k is capital, l is labor, and then we have uh, this alpha here standing in for capital share of income, so a parameter. Uh, let's apply that to our per capita production function. So here's y is output is equal to that. Yep, that's just notationally. Uh, here's what it is definitionally. So we have, um, we have, we're using Cobb Douglas production function, uh, which all the major intermediate macro textbooks uses in one form or another. Um, so we divide that by L to get it in per capita terms. Uh, the next two steps are just kind of like algebraic, uh, yeah, just simple algebra, and it all reduces down to the following. So uh, output per worker, Y, uh, or notationally F of K, you'll see. Uh, is equal to total factor productivity times per capita capital raised to alpha, where alpha is the capital share of income. Um, a lot of times in textbooks, they'll just assume that total factor productivity is one. Uh, and then a lot of times in textbooks, they'll give you a value for alpha. So they'll make it like one half or something like that. But, uh, you know, I want to keep these things pretty general, so I'm going to stick to this. But you can imagine, you know, when you look at a textbook, they'll, they'll give you a production function and they'll maybe make that a one, which makes it go away, and so forth. Cool. Cool. So now we got our production function right here in terms of per capita terms. Cool. So the plan of action uh, now going forward is we're going to try to find the steady state level of capital. Um, so uh, in order to show the steady state level of capital, um, we're going to need to show, um, we're going to work with the capital accumulation equation. And a steady state level of capital is a, is a level of capital such that um, the idea is that k sub t plus 1 equals k sub t, right? So a steady state level of capital is one where capital is the same through time. So we're going to need to tweak this a little bit, first off to convert into per capita terms, and second off to uh, deal with the actual production function we're working with to be able to solve for that steady state level of capital. So that's our end goal, is to find the steady state level of capital, and the, all that we're doing now are steps to get to that goal. So uh, yeah, just reminding, here's the capital accumulation equation, right, which uh, was pretty straightforward, we worked with, rewriting things a little bit. Um, you know, capital next period, the capital stock next period, is equal to the existing capital stock, uh, less depreciation plus any investment. Uh, we know what investment is, right? Investment is just the savings rate times output. So uh, up next, we want to convert things into in terms of per capita terms. So what we're going to do is divide uh, this equation right here, uh, divide both sides by something that's the same thing, right? So uh, the labor force is uh, assumed to be constant, right? It uh, 
you know, doesn't change through time in this, this version yet. So k sub t plus 1 divided by uh, l sub t plus 1. Um, basically, we could both divide